one question that came up, or one observation that came up in the break was that a sister had followed me until I got to the point where I said that the subject of the mystery of godliness during the sounding of the seventh trumpet is a subject that all the prophets spoke about. And I know that's kind of a, a new thought, and I don't want to lose this here because I'm not even taking the time to deal with that subject at this point, but I will go over that for others that may have had the same stumbling. There, there's only a handful of themes that I found. There's probably more than I found, but it's a limited number of truths in God's Word that the Bible itself says that all the prophets spoke about. One of them is Christ. All the prophets spoke about Christ, both in his first coming and in his work of redemption. But another subject that all the prophets spoke about is the development of the 144,000. The pioneers, if you, on your notes on page 30, the pioneers understood that the seventh trumpet began to sound on October 22nd, 1844. They, they make this understanding from, from a number of ways, but in Revelation 11, in the, in the middle of page 30, you have Revelation 11, verses 14 to 19. And uh, there are seven trumpets in the book of Revelation. The first four are trumpets, and the last three trumpets are also called woes. So the book of Revelation, when it speaks about seven trumpets, it identifies that the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpet are the first, second, and third woes. The pioneers deal with the trumpets. This is a foundational understanding of Adventism, the trumpets. Uh, you can see the trumpets illustrated on the 1843 chart. The fifth and sixth trumpet was Islam. The, the fifth trumpet they associated with uh, the, the prophet Muhammad that, was, that came into history around the year 611, 612. That was the fifth trumpet, but it was also the first woe. The sixth trumpet come into history during the time period of the Ottoman Empire. And in the prophecy dealing with the sixth trumpet, that's where we find the, the time prophecy on how long the Ottoman Empire would be in power. The, the starting point for the sixth trumpet, the second woe, was July 27, 1449. And there was a 391-year, 15-day time prophecy that came to a conclusion on August 11th, 1840, when the Ottoman Empire collapsed. This prophecy was part of the sixth trumpet, the second woe. The pioneers correctly taught that on October 22nd, 1844, the seventh trumpet began to sound, verse 7 of Revelation 10. The seventh trumpet began to sound, and during the sounding of the seventh trumpet, which is also the third woe, the mystery of godliness would be completed, which all the servants spoke about. And generally, in the Bible, if you ask a Christian or a Seventh-day Adventist, either one, Christians in general, if you ask them what the mystery of godliness is, the correct answer is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what the mystery of godliness is. But in the context of the sounding of the seventh trumpet, the mystery of godliness, Christ in you, the hope of glory, is talking about the development of the 144,000. The seventh trumpet began to sound on October 22nd, 1844. What happened on October 22nd, 1844? The investigative judgment began. Christ moved into the most holy place to finish the work of judgment. And in the process of finishing the judgment, the crowning act of, of finishing the judgment is the development of the 144,000. So when John in Revelation 10:7 is talking about the sounding of the seventh trumpet, when the mystery of godliness is to be completed, as all the servants, the prophets, spoke about, he's not simply speaking about Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's talking about that time period in history when Christ raises up a group of people that all possess perfectly this experience of Christ in us, the hope of glory. And in the terminology of Revelation and in the, the terminology of Adventism, this is the development of the 144,000, the people that received the seal of God. This is a big subject because all the prophets spoke about it. If you're going to look at this subject in the Bible, you've got you to open the Bible from beginning to end. But it's a subject we haven't studied because all these things have been sealed up. So because of that, at the end of this presentation, I, gave, I put in here an appendix. We're not going to deal with it. 
that shows you that the subject of the 144,000 that all the prophets were speaking about. I mean, there's several pages there that will take you to Old Testament prophets that are talking about the time period when God brings this group of people into existence. It's not just spoken about in the book of Revelation. And it takes place. The 144,000 come into existence during the time period of the sounding of the seventh trumpet or during the time period that we know as the third woe. And in Revelation 11, verses 14 and 19, you'll see the verses that the pioneer used, pioneers used to identify that the seventh trumpet began to sound on October 22, 1844. Verse 14 says, the second woe is past. The second woe was the sixth trumpet. So th this, this passage is going to talk about the third woe, the seventh trumpet. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded. This is the same seventh angel as, that's found in verse 7 of Revelation 10 that we're dealing with. And there were vo great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God. By the way, brothers and sisters, when does Christ receive his kingdom? In the investigative judgment. Prophetically, that's when he receives the kingdom. So this is an agreement with the sounding of the seventh trumpet. It's during this time period of the investigative judgment when Christ is receiving the kingdom. Um, and then it says, saying, We give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee great power and has reigned. And then it starts there at the top with the seventh angel. It says, And the seventh angel sounded. And then John's going to say, And again. The logic is, is that when John is saying, And again, he's taking you back to the sounding of the seventh trumpet. And he says, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that they should give us reward unto the servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. After 1844, Joseph Bates, who is one of the premier leaders of Adventism, he's, the, he's one of the primary students of prophecy that put together the truths of Adventism during that time period, and he came out with a paper, Joseph Bates, where he said the, the, the nations being angry and the wrath of God and the time of the end, they all take place at the same time. And Sister White came out with a statement to straighten him out, and then he backed off of it. And you'll find this statement right below from early writings, page 36. It, she says, I saw that the anger of the nations, the wrath of God, and the time to judge the dead were separate and distinct, one following the other. So this subject here, in the sounding of the seventh trumpet in the third woe, this angering of the nations, the time to, of God's wrath, and the time to judge the dead, it's been specifically identified in inspiration as events that follow one after another. And uh, it's worth understanding. I'm not going to take time to deal with that at this point. But, it, but just so you understand, the only reason the, that the Lord didn't come in the 1840 time period is because all the Millerites didn't follow the truth. The majority of them left the truth on October 22, 1844. But Sister White's clear, had all the Millerites accepted the message and took the message and proclaimed it to the world, the Lord would have came ere this, she said. We're in a conditional prophecy at this point in time. The Lord was willing to come back 100 years ago, 150 years ago, but because of our disobedience, our Laodicean attitude, time has been prolonged. But... In the time period when Jesus returns, what precedes the wrath of God, and brothers and sisters, when's the wrath of God poured out? This is simple. The seven last plagues. When are they poured out? What, what takes place just before the seven last plagues? Michael stands up, human probation closes. And just before that time period, the nations are angry. The nations are angry. So if you understand that we're under a conditional prophecy, and that the Lord was willing to come right after the Millerite time period, then you realize that in the Millerite time period, the nations were angry. It was ready to happen. But because of our disobedience, the time period has been prolonged. Everyone following my logic here up to this point, I want to share something with you now. What nations were angry in the Millerite time period? Because... When it comes time for Christ to finish the work, just before human probation closes, those same 
circumstances are going to come back into history. What nations were angry in the Millerite time period? Brothers and sisters, it's the subject of prophecy. It was when the four great powers of Europe came together to solve the problem of Islam. The angering of the nations in Bible prophecy is when Islam is bringing the nations to anger, which was going on in the 1840s. That was the fulfillment of this prophecy here. Therefore, just before probation closes, just before God's wrath, the nations will be angering again, and the nations, their anger, will be once again brought about by Islam. The only reason that there's been a break in continuity is because God's people have fa failed to do the work of character development. If, if God's people would fully develop Christ's character, he would come today, he would have came 100 years ago. We've prolonged it, but brothers and sisters, if we reach a point in time where we see the nations of the world dealing with radical Islam, and we know, based upon Bible prophecy, that probation is about to close. That's off the subject, sorry. But in this passage, it says, the se and the seventh angel sounded, then it, and the nations were angry. And then it says, and the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. So these three ands, the pioneers correctly say, they tie these thoughts together. During the time period, that the seventh angel begins to sound and that the nations are angry before human probation closes, the temple in heaven would be opened and where you could see the Ark of the Ten Commandments. When was the temple opened when you could see the Ark? October 22, 1844. Christ moved into the most holy place and by faith men could enter, when women could enter into the most holy place and see the Ark. Therefore, the seventh angel began to sound on October 22nd, 1844. That's the pioneer logic. It's sound for this, for, for saying that the seventh trumpet began to sound at that time period. So back to the real subject that we're trying to deal with in Revelation 10. Verse 1 through 4 in Revelation 10. Christ comes down, Revelation 10, 1. And two, he, puts his, with, he has a little book open in his hand. He's the mighty angel. One foot on the land, one foot upon the sea, symbolizing a worldwide message that takes place when he comes down. Um, he he uh, cries loud like a lion, and in response to his crying out, there are seven thunders, which Sister White says represents this history. And then in verse 5, and six, Christ makes a pronouncement that time shall be no longer and that the seventh trumpet would begin to sound. So what, I'm, what I want you to see, if you'll see, is that verses one through four, Christ coming down and the seventh thunder sounding and the seven thunders being sealed up is representing, it's covering the history of 1840 when Christ came down until the seventh thunder sounded, the delineation of events that took place during the first and second angel's messages. And then this history sealed up. So the first four verses is dealing with this history. You see, you see my logic? And verses 5, 6, and 7 is de dealing specifically with October 22, 1844. Because verses 5 and 6 are saying, this is where time is no longer. And ti prophetic time came to an end on October 22, 1844. That's verses 5 and 6. And verse 7 is saying, at this point in time, the seventh trumpet begins to sound. So verses 1 through 7 in Revelation 10 are dealing with this history. Do you see that? You see that? That isn't, that, I don't think that's too difficult to see. Then, verses 5 through 7, we went through. Verses 8 through 10 in the middle of page 31. This is where John is told to go take the little book that's in the angel's hand. So, after verses 1 through 7, deal with the history of 1840 to 1844, then we see John commanded to go take the book out of the angel's hand. So in reality, John's going back to verse 1. The angel comes down out of heaven with the little book out of his hand. There's a, there's a story told that is that's told under the heading of the seven thunders. And then in verse 8, John's going to tell, give us another line of prophecy. John's used to symbolize the Millerite people. He's saying, go take that book from the angel. 
And he took the book back here, and it was sweet in his mouth, the book of Daniel. Here's, here's the sweetness. They understood these truths, the Millerites, during this time period. They take this book, it's sweet, but by verse 10, they've taken the book of Daniel, it's sweet in their mouth, becomes bitter in their stomach. So if, if you look at it correctly, I believe, verses 8 and 10 is simply another illustration of this history. It's the Millerites during this history. This is standard Adventist understanding, by the way. But then verse 11, brothers and sisters, it teaches that this history is repeated after the disappointment. Then John's told, center of the page 31, and he said unto me, thou must prophesy again. This is after October 22nd, before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. This is in agreement with Sister White saying the seven trumpets represent the history of the Millerite movement from 1840 to 1844 and relate to future events. Sister White says the seven thunders represented this history back then, the beginning of Adventism and the end of Adventism. And in verse 11, it's Revelation 10 saying the same thing. Everything that happened from verse 1 to verse 10 must happen again. That's in agreement with the parable of the ten virgins. Fulfilled to the very letter then and again. But brothers and sisters, August 11th, 1840, to October 22nd, 1844, was sealed up. Was sealed up. In Revelation 22, verses 10 and 11, verse 11 is the classic place in the book of Daniel where probation the close of probation is illustrated. What book goes with the book of Revelation? Daniel. Where is the classic illustration of the close of probation in the Bible? It's Daniel 12.1. As Seventh-day Adventists, we know in Daniel 12.1, when Michael stands up, that that's the classic illustration of the close of probation. But the books of Daniel and Revelation, they're one book. They go together. They bring each other to perfection, correct? So when you bring the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation together and you see Michael standing up in Daniel 12.1, you see the physical action that Michael does when human probation closes, but in Revelation 22.11, you find out what Michael says as he stands up. And what he says as he's standing up is, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. When you bring Daniel and Revelation together, you realize what Michael does as he stands up and what he says as he stands up. But what I want you to see is what happens just before probation closes. This is serious. If, if, if what I'm suggesting right here is correct, you need to understand the logic of this. In Revelation 22.11, we have the close of human probation. Just prior to the close of human probation is verse 10. And what does verse 10 say? And he said unto me, this is the bottom of page 31, and he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Brothers and sisters, what part of the book of Revelation was sealed up? The seven thunders. And the book of Revelation says just before human probation closes, the prophecy in the book of Revelation that has been sealed up will be seal unsealed. Why? Because the time is at hand. The time for what? The time for the unsealing of the little book that brings the increase of knowledge that the wise understand and the wicked do not understand when you bring Daniel 12 into it and we're not there yet. There's unsealing that has to take place in this history at the end of the world because there was an unsealing that took place in the Millerite time period. The unsealing that took place in the Millerite time period was the book of Daniel, but the unsealing that takes place in the time period of the 144,000 is the prophecy in the book of Revelation that was sealed up, the seven thunders, and what was sealed up? What was sealed up that gets unsealed at the end of the world just before probation closes? The history of the Millerite time period. Not simply the history of the Millerite time period, but the truth that this history is illustrating 
the end of the world. Now, if this is true, you're hearing the message that gets unsealed just before human probation closes. Serious information. And you'll see two quotes on the fact that Revelation is also a sealed book. Um, you'll see the appendix for number three, dealing with the subject of the 144,000. And we will launch into our next presentation, and you will find that on page 44. <coughs> we start with the mighty angel of Revelation 10.1. This mighty angel that comes down with his foot upon the land, his foot upon the sea. Who is this angel? It's Christ. We read a quote where Sister White plainly says this was Christ. When did he come down? When did this mighty angel come down in Revelation 10.1? August 11th, 1840. And what was this a fulfillment of also? Beyond being the mighty angel of Revelation 10, what was also this a fulfillment of? The, the fall of the Ottoman Empire, but the first angel's message, right? This is the first angel's message being empowered. So what I want you to see, if you will, is in Revelation 10.1, the angel that comes down is Christ, but the first angel in the three angels' message, it's Christ. Because Christ is the mighty angel that, it, that took this first angel's message to the world. In fact, the closer you look at Bible prophecy, it's Christ from the beginning to the end. It's Christ. that this is these angels in the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel. I mean, Gabriel's an angel, but the three angels. Next page. Revelation 14, 6 through 12 is the three angels' message. Um, <clears throat> you'll notice that in the first angel's message, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell upon the earth. One of the things that we've been emphasizing here is that the first angel's message was a message that went to the entire world. Whereas Sister White specifically says that the second angel's message was fulfilled in the United States. There's a a specific difference between the first angel's message and the second angel's message. The first angel's message goes to the entire world. That's when the mighty angel comes down in Revelation 10. He has his foot upon the land and the sea. It's going to the entire world, whereas the second angel's message goes just, went just to the United States. There's a purposeful distinction in inspiration between these two angels. And here in the first angel's message, we see that part of this message is it goes to all mankind. Now, notice the fourth angel. We asked this question last night, and it, 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 we got some vague answers, but it was the end of the week, and it was late at night. I'm not sure. Maybe we all understood this. But where it says the fourth angel, this is the angel that we're waiting for, the angel, angel where the loud cry, latter rain, is poured out upon us. Loud cry message goes forth. And let's read this in Revelation 18, verses 1 through 5. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. What was lightened with his glory? The earth. When the mighty angel came down in Revelation 10, what was lightened with his glory? The earth. It was a message that went worldwide. So when Revelation 18, angels comes down, the earth is lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great has fallen, has fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacy. And I heard another voice. Do you see that? The fourth angel has two voices. I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sin, and that you receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Now, brothers and sisters, what we're going to suggest here to you as we proceed, we're going to show it to you. How many have heard the term, the loud cry of the fourth angel? You ever heard of the loud cry of the fourth angel? Do you know when inspiration says it takes place? 
When does the loud cry of the fourth angel take place? In terms of the verses that we just read. No, I, you're not following my question. That's my fault. There's two voices in the fourth angel's message. The first voice that lightens the whole earth with his glory. And then another voice. So you've got two voices. Which one of them is the loud cry of the fourth angel? It's the second voice. Inspiration is clear. The second voice is the loud cry of the fourth angel. And brothers and sisters, it's at the loud cry of the fourth angel when the, the latter rain is poured out. The latter rain is not poured out when the first angel comes down. He's poured out when the second voice is raised. We're going to show that to you. And my point is this. In the fourth angel, the fourth angel is broken into two parts. The first part is a message that goes to the whole world. And the second part is where the latter rain is poured out. And brothers and sisters, in the first and second angel's message, the history that we're discussing here, the first angel's message went to the entire world. And during the second angel's message, at the midnight cry, the latter rain was poured out. The loud cry is paralleling the midnight cry. It's not an accidental distinction in Revelation 18 that it's in two parts. It's purposeful. The fourth angel's message has two parts. The first part is basically a description of Babylon. If you read the first part, it's describing how Babylon's been connected with the merchants of the earth and the kings of the earth. The loud cry of the other voice is when they're called out of Babylon. So let's see if we can see that. First, we're going to look at angels. Angels. Warning so important. Great Controversy 595. When God sends men, warning so important that they are represented as proclaimed by angels flying in the midst of heaven, he requires every person endowed with reasoning power to heed the message. Everyone in this room needs to heed the message that these four angels represent. Next quote. The angels are symbolic of God's people. They're symbolic of God's people. I have had precious opportunities to an ob obtain an experience. I've had an experience in the first, second, and third angel's messages. The angels are represented as flying in the midst of heaven, proclaiming to the world a message of warning and having a direct bearing upon people living in the last day of this earth's history. No one hears the voice of these angels. These aren't real angels. For they are a symbol to represent the people of God who are working in harmony with the universe of heaven. Men and women, enlightened by the Spirit of God and sanctified through the truth, proclaim the three messages in their order. Inspiration always says, retain their order. I was shown that the third angel proclaiming the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus represents the people who received this message and raised the voice of warning to the world. Perhaps the most important one in some sense, is the next quote. Under the appropriate symbol of an angel flying through the midst of heaven is represented the work of the people of God. Now, here's why this is important for me for this one point. You may not be seeing it yet, but what we're suggesting here is that in this time period, August 11th, 1840, until October 22nd, 1844, the parable of the ten virgins was fulfilled to the very letter. We looked at that last night. And we looked at the quote where it said it would be fulfilled again to the very letter at the end of the world. Then we took another line of prophecy this morning, line upon line, here a little, there a little. We looked at the seven thunders. The seven thunders identified the identical history as the parable of the ten virgins. And the seven th thunders represent the events of the Millerite movement and the events that take place at the end of the world. And then we looked at John in Revelation 10, 11, emphasizing this repeat of history again when he says, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples, nations, and kingdoms. Now we're looking at another line of prophecy. And brothers and sisters, this line of prophecy is the fourth angel's message. In the parable of the ten virgins, Sister White says that line of prophecy is identifying the experience of God's people. In Revelation 10, the theme of Revelation 10 is not the experience of God's people. We read the quote where Sister White says, it's identifying the part that Christ plays in this history. 
But this history is also symbolized in the history of the fourth angel's message and the angels, the three angels' message, the fourth angel's message, it's not symbolic of the experience of God's people. It's not representing the part that Christ plays in this history. It's identifying the work that gets carried out in this history. Sister White says, under the appropriate symbol of an angel flying through the midst of heaven is represented the work of the people of God, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. These lines of truth are developing the complete picture if we will see it, if we will see it. So when we're talking about the history of the fourth angel's message, and that's where we're going right here, the history of the fourth angel's message is the history at the end of the world. It's a little bit different than the, the seven thunders in the parable of the ten virgins because the parable of the ten virgins and the seven thunders already took place back here. The fourth angel's message is an illustration of this history when it gets repeated at the end of the world. It's still this history, but it's just dealing with, okay, here's this history when it finally arrives, when it's repeated. And sure enough, in the history of the parable of the ten virgins, in the history of the seven thunders, that's the history of the first and the second angel's message. The first angel's message, the mighty angel came down, put his foot upon the sea, the foot upon the earth. It was a message that went to the entire world. The second angel's message is where the Holy Spirit is poured out. And when we look closely at the history of the fourth angel's message, when it arrives in history, when it finally arrives, the first part is when the message goes to the entire world. And the second part, the other voice, is where the Holy Spirit's poured out. This is this history in the future. It's the same line of prophecy, but it's future. Probably I'm not, probably not expressing that well, but that's what it is. So there's some other quotes here about these angels. The three angels' message, the fourth angel's message, aren't truly angels. They're representing the work that God's people accomplish as they are confronted with these messages. They come to understand these messages. They bring their life into agreement with these messages, and then they proclaim these messages. That's what these angels are representing. So on page 47, the other angel, the same quote from Revelation 18, the fourth angel divided into two parts. He sees another angel come down from heaven, and then he hears another voice. Sister White says, we've read this quote we've, in our notes already, the other angel who unites in the proclamation of the third angel's message is to lighten the whole earth with his glory. Now, now, this may be a little bit tricky here. This may be a little bit tricky, so I'm forewarning you. I'm going to ask some questions. <laughs> Try to follow me on this. When did the third angel's message arrive? 1844. Since 1844, the third angel's message has been going forward. And what we're saying here now, if you're not following the purpose of this particular study, is we're saying that the fourth angel's message is another illustration of this sacred history that we're considering, all right? And this history that prefigures the end of the world, in 1833, William Miller began to proclaim a message. What was his message? It was the first angel's message. It was going forward. But it wasn't empowered until August 11th, 1840. So if you're going to look at the... the the dynamics of the whole history, there's a message that's being proclaimed for a period of time. William Miller's message, the first angel's message, comes to a point when it's empowered and then this sacred history of the first and second angel's message takes place. It concludes at the third angel's message. But at the end of the world, this history is repeated. So, at the end of the world, there must be a message that has been proclaimed. What was, what's the message that has been being proclaimed as we come to the end of the world? It's the message of the third angel that started in 1844. And as we come to the end of the world, the third angel's message is still the message of the hour. But to parallel this history, there will come a time when God will empower the third angel's message. 
And as Seventh-day Adventists, we know when the third angel's message is empowered. When is it empowered, prophetically? No. Yes and no. It's when the fourth angel joins the third. This is when the third angel is empowered. I know there's, I, there are different levels of Adventists in here. I know there's some newer Adventists, some that haven't even become Adventists yet. But in Adventism, it is standard understanding that the third angel's message, it began on October 22nd, 1844. It becomes empowered at the end of the world when it's joined with the fourth angel's message. That's standard understanding, although Adventists haven't really taken the time to really wrap their minds around what that means. So, what I'm saying is that this history is repeated at the end of the world. There is a message that has been proclaimed since 1844. The message in the Millerite time period was being proclaimed from 1833 by William Miller, but since 1844, Seventh-day Adventists have been proclaiming the third angel's message. There will come a time when God empowers the third angel's message, and then after that time, there will be part two of this for final warning message when the other angel's voice calls people out of Babylon and the Holy Spirit is poured out. This is what we call the loud cry. Now, you haven't seen that. Parallels the midnight cry. But we'll show you that Sister White is very specific about this that the loud cry takes place during the second voice in Revelation 18, not the first voice. So let me ask you some simple questions, even though I'm getting ahead of myself. What brought about the empowerment of the Millerite message? Pardon me? A collapse of an empire of Bible prophecy. Where, what is one of the prophetic characteristics of that empire? It's the power that came from the bottomless pit, right? What brought the power in the first angel's message was a collapse of an empire of Bible prophecy that happens to be a power from the bottomless pit based upon a prophecy in the Bible. So, if this is all fulfilled again to the very letter at the end of the world, how will the Lord empower the third angel's message at the end of the world? By a collapse of an empire of Bible prophecy that came from the bottomless pit in fulfillment of a prophecy in the Bible. And brothers and sisters, in 1989, verse 40 of Daniel 11 was fulfilled, which predicted the collapse of atheism, which is a power of Bible prophecy that comes from the bottomless pit. The fourth angel of Revelation 18, paralleling the mighty angel of Revelation 18, Ten, one came down in 1989. What's ahead is the loud cry. And the loud cry takes place at the Sunday Law in the United States. The prophecy of the collapse of the Soviet Union is found in verse 40 of Daniel 11. And the Sunday Law is found in verse 41 of Daniel 11. The next thing to happen is the Sunday law in the United States. And what happens during the second angel's message? The door closes. Probation's about to close. And just before probation closes, according to Revelation 22, 10 and 11, this history is unsealed so that God's people at the end of the world can understand these things and make ready for the crisis that's about to hit. So, let's continue on. Sister White here at page 47 is saying that the, she compares the fourth angel of Revelation 18 with the first angel's message. And the first angel's message is also the angel of Revelation 10, the mighty angel that comes down. In the Millerite time period, a mighty angel comes down at the beginning of the history. That's the mighty angel of Revelation 10. When this history is repeated, the mighty angel that comes down is the mighty angel of Revelation 18. And Sister White says the mighty angel that came down in Revelation 10 was Christ. So what mighty angel came down in 1989? Christ came down in 1989. <clears throat> Next page, 48.
Um, and parallels, second voice. Okay, we went over this. This is some of the quotes that I would use to make these points. Um, this, this, the other voice of Revelation 18 parallels the second angel's message. Um, it's here where the midnight cry took place. It's here where the loud cry is going to take place. First angel's message, the mighty angel of Revelation 10, worldwide, the, the first angel of Revelation 18 lightens the earth with his glory. Um, the d bottom page 48, the door closes during the fourth angel's message and the second angel's message. We read where Sister White compares the two times that Christ cleansed the temple while he was on earth here. She compares it. If you're very careful with that, those quotes, she uses the second angel's message to line up with the first time Christ cleansed the temple, and then she used the loud cry of the fourth angel's message. We're going we're to look at some quotes. It's in this other voice of Revelation 18 that is the loud cry. The first voice of Revelation 18. There's two voices. Does everyone see the two voices of the fourth angel in Revelation 18, verse 1 through 5? I hope you see that. Because inspiration is clear that it's in the second voice where the loud cry takes place. It, it, you, must, you must lock that in if you're going to see this history accurately. Um, st page 49. More and more, at the top of the page, the door closes at the loud cry of the third angel's message. More and more as the days go by, it is becoming apparent that God's judgment are in the world. In fire and flood and earthquake, he is warning the inhabitants of the earth of his near approach. Of course, we haven't seen any fire, floods, and earthquakes here in the past 15 or 20 years, have we? Almost on a regular basis. That means the Lord is approaching. There's one place where Sister White's talking about these events that I like for my own personal preference. She says these events are the footsteps of an approaching God. The time is nearing when the great crisis in, his, in the history of the world will have come, when every movement in the government of God will be watched with intense interest and inexpressible apprehension. In quick succession, the judgments of God will follow one another, fire and flood and earthquake with war and bloodshed. Oh, that the people, of God, people might know the time of their visitation. There are many who have not yet heard the testing truth for this time. There are many with whom the Spirit of God is striving. The time of God's destructive judgments is a time of mercy for those who have had no opportunity to learn what is truth. I'm talking about people outside of Adventism here. There's going to be a time period of God's destructive judgment which is still a time of mercy for people outside of Adventism. And then she continues on. Tenderly, tenderly will the Lord look upon those people outside of Adventism. Tenderly will the Lord look upon them. His heart of mercy is touched. His hand is stretched out to save while the door is closed to those who would not enter. The door closes in here, second angel's message time period. Progressively. Did, did the probation close progressively in this history, brothers and sisters, of the Millerite time period? First, the organized churches closed their doors. The denominations in the United States closed their doors against the first angel's message, the Millerite message, and then the door closed upon the virgin. Probation closes progressively, closes progressively here at the end, too. Fulfilled to the very letter. There's more to say about that that I'm not taking time to. It's outside the scope of this study. But the latter rain begins at the loud cry. Notice this. On page 33, this is from the appendix of early writings. On page 33 is given the following. I saw that the Holy Sabbath is and will be the separating wall between the true Israel of God and unbelievers, and believers, and that the Sabbath is the great question to unite the hearts of God's dear waiting saints. I saw that God had children who did not see and keep the Sabbath. They have not rejected light upon it. At the commencement of the time of trouble, we were filled with the Holy Ghost and went forth to proclaim the Sabbath more fully. This view was given in 1847 when there were but few of the Advent brethren observing the Sabbath, and of these but few suppose that its observance was significant importance was of significant importance to draw a line between the people of God and unbelievers. Now the fulfillment of that view is be beginning to be seen. 
The commencement of that time of trouble here mentioned does not refer to the time when the plague shall begin to be poured out, but to a short period just before they are poured out while Christ is in the sanctuary. At that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming on the earth, and the nations will be angry, yet held in check so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. At that time, the latter rain, or refreshing from the presence of the Lord, will come to give power to the loud voice of the third angel and prepare the saints to stand in the period when the seven last plagues shall be poured out. The latter rain comes at the loud cry of the third angel's message prior to the close of all human probation. Notice this next quote. There are true Christians in every church not accepting the Roman Catholic communion. None are condemned until they've had light and have seen the obligation of the fourth commandment. But when the decree, Sunday law decree, but when this decree shall go forth enforcing the counterfeit Sabbath and the loud cry of the third angel shall warn men against the worship of the beast of its image, then the, the line will be clearly drawn between the false and the true. Then those... Who, are, who still continue in transgression will receive the mark of the beast. It's at the loud cry of the third angel's message, but at the part, the second part of the second, of the fourth angel's message. This is confusing for me. It's going to be confusing for you. The loud cry of the third angel's message takes place when the fourth angel joins the third. But the fourth angel has two parts. And the part where the call out of Babylon under the latter reign takes place in the fourth angel's message is under the other voice, under the other voice. It's not under the first voice in Revelation 18. Um, back up to page 48, and I'll show this to you. <clears throat> Bottom of page 48, the second voice parallels the second angel and is the loud cry of the third angel's message. Take a deep breath. This will clear our minds maybe a little bit. I, I want you to see this. Here we go. The second angel's message is Babylon has fallen, has fallen that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Revelation 14.8. And in the loud cry of the third angel's message, a voice is heard from heaven. Sister White is now defining what the loud cry of the third angel's message is. How does she define it? She quotes this angel. She says, And in the loud cry of the third angel's message, a voice is heard from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partaker of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. If you look up on the page to the two voices, you'll see that that statement is made by the other voice the second voice. You see where it says two voices and it quotes Revelation 18, 1 through 5. And the first thing it says is, I saw another angel come down from heaven and the earth was lightened with his glory. And then down at the bottom it says, I heard another voice. It's this second voice of the fourth angel that makes this statement come out of her, my people, that Sister White says is the loud cry of the third angel. The loud cry of the third angel takes place in voice number two of Revelation 18, and it's at that point that the latter rain is poured out upon God's people. It's that at that point that people outside of Adventism that haven't understood Sabbath and Sunday come and stand with the Sabbath keepers. It's at that point that the Sunday law test arrives and the door closes upon Adventism. And those in Adventism that haven't prepared for the seal of God receive the mark of the beast. It's in part two of the fourth angel's message. Please take note of that. Inspiration is clear about that. It's what allows you to see that the, fourth, the history of the fourth angel's message runs perfectly parallel with the Millerite time period, the parable of the ten virgins and the seven thunders. Um, notice page 50. The door closes at the loud cry of the third angel. The midnight cry parallels the, loud, parallels the loud cry. And then you have a, a bold face heading that says, then the first and second angel's messages run parallel with the fourth. 
What does it mean to run parallel? It means they line up, line up on line. Notice what we're told here. God has given the message of Revelation 14, the messages of Revelation 14, their place in the line of prophecy. And their work is not to cease till the close of this earth's history. The first and second angel's message are still truth for this time and are to run parallel with that which follows. The first and second angel's message are to run parallel with that which follows. What follows? The third and fourth angel's message and the fourth angel's message is divided up in two parts. And when you take the third and fourth angel's message and line them up like this, they run perfectly parallel with the first and second angel's message. Do you see it? If you see it, raise your hand. Even in the back, you're seeing it. Okay. Next quote, the great message combining the first, second, and third angel's messages is to be given to the world. This is the burden of our work. Brothers and sisters, what, what we've been attempting to do here last night and this morning is com to combine the first, second, third, fourth parable of the ten virgins, the seven thunders. And you know what inspiration says? This is the burden of our work because this is the message that we need to understand if we're going to understand what takes place at the end, which has been illustrated in the beginning. See some more quotes on uh, the three angels' messages. Um, go to the pa bottom, page 51, and we'll summarize this presentation, hopefully. After the last quote there from Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, it says this. This is my words. Christ the mighty angel descended in Revelation 10 on the 11th of August, 1840. His descent took place at the collapse of a power from the bottomless pit in pro Bible prophecy. That was Islam. The collapse was the fulfillment of a prophecy located in Revelation 9, verse 15. Christ, the other angel of Revelation 18, descended in 1989. His descent took place at the collapse of a power from the bottomless pit in Bible prophecy, atheism. The collapse was in fulfillment of Daniel 11.40. When Christ descended in Revelation 10 in fulfillment of Revelation 9.15, the first angel's message empowered the Philadelphian church. When Christ descended in Revelation 18 in fulfillment of Daniel 11.40, the fourth angel had the potential to empower the Laodicean church. There's the difference, brothers and sisters. The Millerites were Philadelphians, but God's people at the end of the world are Laodiceans. That's the caveat to this history. They were on fire for the word of God, and we're trying to do everything we can to prevent ourselves from coming under conviction of the Holy Spirit that the end of the world is here. That's the difference that has to be understood in these two histories. The empowerment of the Philadelphian church was brought about by Josiah Litch's publication of the prophecy of Revelation 9.15, identifying the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. The empowerment of the Laodicean church was not brought about, though a publication of the prophecy of Daniel 11.40, identifying the collapse of the Soviet Union, was produced by a Seventh-day Adventist pastor named Louis Weir in 1957. The same history was there, but were Laodiceans, they were Philadelphians. There's another line of prophecy we're going to add up on this in our next presentation, which is Daniel 12, which is also an illustration of this same history. And uh, we'll take that up in our next presentation. Shall we pray? <coughs> Heavenly Father, we wish to understand these things in such a fashion that your Holy Spirit convicts us of our personal need of preparation. We give you permission to do what it takes in our lives to, to make this happen. We want to be among those that carry this final warning message that is symbolized by these angels. We want to be awoken and empowered early enough to reach out to our families and our friends and our neighbors and give them time to prepare as well. We thank you for being with us so far through these studies. And we ask a blessing upon the rest of the day in Jesus' name. Amen.